the leader is is a leader because he is a servant. This leader is someone who inspires his followers, her followers. Through our series of Tutu Talks, the Desmond and Leah Tutu Legacy Foundation hopes to reframe unresolved issues within civil society and uncover what moral and ethical leadership entails. Victor, welcome and thank you very much for joining us all the way from Uganda. It's a great honor. Thank you so much for welcoming me to this fantastic platform. Tell us about where you grew up and what your childhood was like. I was born and raised in the northern part of Uganda in the district called Lira and my home village is called Abia. Abia, if anybody can Google, it's a place which is uh, is one of the signatory crime point for uh, the atrocities as a result of the war between the Lord Resistance Army and the government of Uganda. He had a childhood that was defined by years and years of conflict. I've been through several violent uh, conflicts where I was born and raised in war zone. I grew up in the, in the conflict zone. I spent my entire childhood for my first 20 years, I was actually spent in the internally displaced people's camp. So as a child, I would move along with my parents. I was a displaced person. So to me, war is pretty much part of my life as I was growing up. And uh, the, the life of displacement is the life I lived in, the, the life I survived, is the life I grew for all this time. So I had a child that was defined by so many hiccups of life, you know, hardship, pain, suffering, but also most importantly, uh, hope. There was a lot of hope and faith in the future. And I think it was right. And um, what about school and things like that in, in, a, in a situation where there's, there's war and, and it's constant? Yeah, you know, growing up in war zone, especially in northern Uganda, uh, we were caught up in the middle of conflict and education wasn't like the priority. The number one priority was to survive and to get what to eat, to get where you're going to sleep, and also to like always hide and keep yourself secured from harmed uh, forces. But then um, as a child, of course, like in the children, I would have loved to grow up in a community where education was possible, was free. But when I grew up, I, I was only exposed to demolition and destruction as a result of war. Our schools were banned as early as when we were only starting our schooling. When the schools were burnt down, the teachers were abducted, so many of them were killed, they were displaced. So as a child, I grew up wondering, wishing that, like many others, I wanted to grow up and study to become a doctor, to become a teacher, to become a pilot like another person. But that was a daydream. And actually, how education life was like, we never studied to work. We had to work to study. As a child, I had to work to study because my parents were poor. They, they were too poor to buy for us food. They couldn't even afford to buy pencils and all that. So we had to work, do all the casual labors to raise money, to buy a pencil, to buy a school uniform, to buy school books. But of course, the struggle was a battle between safety, uh, feeding, and education, which education was never the priority at some point. So, but uh, again, when I, myself, when I started, uh, completed primary one, in Uganda's education, you're supposed to go through uh, for seven years to complete primary education. But after completing primary one, we were displaced for about five years. And then uh, I was supposed to resume that schooling. And then I ended up spending, studying only uh, for three years that I studied primary education, which is supposed to be for seven years in Uganda. So it was kind of a magical leap that I had to uh, synchronize my study to spend three years studying primary education like many others who could have studied seven years. So that was my journey. But of course, the struggle was I needed to do all the petty, hard labors to burn charcoal, to, to dig people's garden, 
to make bricks, to sell, to raise money, to buy school fees, you know, school, school material, scholastic material to pay my school fees and all that. So I'm very lucky that today I can speak fairly good English. But yes, it's been a very difficult educational journey. It was painful for my dad to see his children were risking their life that much in order to pursue education. And he also felt so powerless as a father that he couldn't provide for his children. So I could see the pain in his eyes, even at night, I could feel it. You, you grew up in a, in a time where young kids were being recruited to become child soldiers. What, what was your response to, to that at a, a young age? Yeah, it is true that I, I grew up in Uganda on the peak of child abduction and recruitment, mass recruitment of children as soldiers. And it was actually being done on both sides, on the side of the government in the name of ancillary forces and all local home guards, and also on the side of the rebel where they were abducting children and recruiting them, forcefully recruiting them to become soldiers. It was a very, very powerful dilemma in a community where even the, the government that's supposed to protect you is the one mobilizing you that you can go on and become your own guards, protect your own community. And it was indiscriminate of how, regardless of how old, how young you are. And children as young as I was, my age men, some were even younger than me, as young as 12 or 10, volunteered to go and fight. Because the message was simple. Either you go pick up the gun to fight the rebel, you may shoot the rebel or fire the gun, the rebel might run away. Or you just stay home and be abducted by the Lord Resistance Army. So it was, the choice was either you're taken by the rebel or you pick up the gun from the government side. And there were a lot of other, un, other illegal guns as well in the community. So as a child, there was one particular day, we went fetching water. And then on our way back from about two kilometers fetching water from the well, uh, my two friends in front were blown off by the landmines. And then uh, we ran, we ran toward, we ran home actually. And our mother said, "What's going on?" Said the two friends were blown off by the landmines. And then we were crying. And then she told us, "Okay, it's okay. Now you can calm down. Go and change the, go and change the cows. Pick up the cows and bring them home because they were, we had some two, three cows we were keeping around home. It was about like 500 meters away, not 500, 300 meters away from home. My mother sent me to go and pick the cows and bring home." I left my friends home. My two remaining friends, I left them at home. I think my twin brother had, went, had, had gone to the center, sort of. So in the process of me going and coming back, I came and, I came and asked my mom. I saw her crying. I said, what happened? Where are my friends? And then mother said, they are taken away. And I said, taken away by who? Then said, the rebel. They just passed by. It's like, you just as soon as you left, within that less than 10 minutes, gap. I came, I came and they were gone. And that was the most difficult part. I think from that day, the question that started coming in my heart was, who next? The question was, who next? Everybody was being abducted. Everybody was being killed. Parents were being killed. Children were abducted and being killed. The question was, who next? And that's when I felt that it was closing on I was becoming the next person. The, the next question was, who next? And the answer was pretty much me. And I realized that it was the same feeling for everybody who had remained in the community. So it was a very difficult moment. And the next day, I saw everybody out of frustration. Those who were not abducted went on to register to become rebel and fight. So I responded. I was actually 13 years then. Because my mom had told us that, will you promise to me that you will not fight and kill anybody? And he told us, mom will not fight. I will not fight. I had promised to her at the age of 12 that I will never learn how to shoot a gun. And I will not pick up the gun to fight anybody. And then he said, okay. She so would always say, remember your promise. You remember your promise. And yes. I told mom that with all this coming up, with the mass recruitment going on, with mass abductions going on, we need to do something. I picked up and I went and sat 300 meters away from the recruitment center where the local uh, defense unit of the government 
were recruiting people, women, children. They said anybody who can shoot the gun should come and pick up the gun. That was the message. And then um, I sat like 300 meters from the recruitment center. I started pushing some of my friends who were walking towards to be recruited because I knew even the only remaining friends I had were going to pick up the gun. I started pushing them. I was actually crying when I pushed them. I was pushing, saying, no, don't go, please don't go. You'll be killed if you go. And then they were calling me, coward, you are weak, you are not being patriotic, you are not protecting your population, your community. Said, but tell me, these guys who are going, they are all being disarmed and killed. What are you going? We, are, we can also, you know, yes, out of anger, we can all go pick up the gun to fight and, and kill ourselves. Or we can also choose another way and stop the killing and be a different group of people who are not into killing our enemies because even if you go pick up the gun to go and fight now, you're not going to fight the rebels. You're fighting your brothers and your sisters who were abducted yesterday. They put them. So government sends you to go and fight your brothers who were taken yesterday. They did not protect them. They were taken. They were not protected. And now they're on the side of the rebels. They're being fronted against each other. So that was the beginning of my initiative to form the Peace Club. I started the Peace Club in the internally displaced people's camp, primarily to help me decampaign the child soldiers recruitment, to mobilize my friends to say no to being recruited, and to challenge the narrative that we were born to fight each other. And it was a choice that was very costly on my side because I became very unpopular. I became referred to as a weak coward. I was the call a woman. Many, many things, you know, the thing women, they say men don't die at home. They go and die in the battlefield. This was the culture. Why are you doing this? All the uh, derogatory description that came on me was because I said, let us not fight. Let us, let us choose peace. And people were asking me, why are you talking about peace that you have never lived? You don't know what peace looks like. You don't even know what it, it feels to be peaceful. And you are here promoting peace. Are you crazy? Why are you being very falsely visionary that you're talking about something that you have never seen, never lived, never experienced? I said, yeah, it's true. I've never lived. But I think I'm just so tired of the kind of life we're living right now. I'm tired of the life of war. We're going without food. We are hungry. We're falling sick. We're surviving. Every step you walk, you're not so sure if you're not stepping on a landmine. Every house you enter, you're not so sure if then you're coming out of the house, somebody will be waiting for you with a gun at the door. And you didn't, the worst part was the feeling that your mother was gone to fetch water. If at all she would come back home alive. Your sister who is going to look for water to, to, to get you water and firewood and everything. You are not so sure if they will go and come back home alive or not sexually abused. This was the fear that I grew up in. And this was the fear that was very, very strongly in our community. So my purpose of forming the Peace Club was to help me promote the culture that was not there. I was dreaming about something that did not exist and I had so many opposition, but it didn't matter because I achieved the mission. It took so long before people could accept it, but few accepted it, started saying that, okay, there is reality, there's some sense in what he's talking about. But majority initially had opposed to me. And since then, I never stopped talking about peace. I never stopped opposing to any doctrines that promotes violence or killing or attack or destruction of the society. That was a very courageous thing to do at such a, a young age, in your teenage years. Yeah. Um, how, how have you found the strength, the optimism, you talked about um, hope right at the beginning of our interview. Um, and how have you found forgiveness as well as you have grown? Yeah, I think, to be honest with you, um, I must attribute a lot of messages of courage and support and love to my parents. Our parents lacked everything. They lacked food to give us. They lacked clothing to give us. Some parents with capacity 
relocated their families to the cent to the urban setting to towns, but our family didn't even have a dollar in a week. There was nothing going on, so they didn't have food, but they gave us love. They always gave us love. Our mother would always hold our hands. She never let us down. She never left us. Every time we were together, she would take us through the prayers, through the. I think to me, faith in the future was the epicenter of my mother's concentration. She knew it was tough, what we are going through, but she always had hope that one day war will be over and we should have faith in future that it will be fine one day. So I would say religion played a big role in my upbringing. The spirituality, the power of love was so much feared by my religious understanding. Because Daddy and Mommy gave us everything they could to, to make sure that we, we, we don't or get overruled by anger. And also, I think our mom had such a magical strength to the point that she sacrificed too much and I think to the point that she sacrificed our life so that we could live, so that we could uh, grow up. It was a very, it was a very difficult choice to for a parent to still tell the child then that war would be over because there was no option. There was no chance. There was no, there was no future. And I remember when I was a child, I did, I saw the plane moving in the sky with the smoke fumes. And I asked her, I said, what is that? And then she said, it's a plane. And then I said, how do people get in that plane? And then she told me that I was actually lying, leaning on her lap. They said, yeah, for you to get there, you have to, study. And then she said, and then I said, okay, that means automatically I will never be there. And then she said, no, you will always be in the plane. I said, but you said I should study. I have stayed for five years without going to school. I only stopped in P1. And then my mother prophetically said that you will one day sit in a plane that you will not want. You will sit so much that you don't want to sit in the plane anymore. And I said, are you kidding me? Because I know you're trying to be positive here, mommy, but you know this is not possible. We don't even have food to eat this evening. Then said, don't mind, you'll sit in the plane, you'll get tired of sitting in the plane one day. And I think uh, our prophecy never went without, I saw it happen. I saw mommy's, you know, prophecy about what would look like. I've been in planes, I've been flying around the world. Unfortunately, she missed to see that, what she told us. But yes, the love that we had came in from our parents. Can we talk about your brother? Oh, yes. Um, you, you um, when we spoke earlier, told me a very, very powerful story about how you, um, on a very personal level, found um, a way to forgive what happened to him. Can you tell us about that? I was born in the family of 10 and I'm a child number eight, uh, one of the twin sons. And the brother whom we followed was called Geoffrey, Geoffrey Omara. Uh, Geoffrey would be, would be 42 years today, would be 43, uh, 42 years now. Uh, he was abducted by the rebels in 2003, on the ninth, night of 9th to 10th of December, which is International Human Rights Day. Uh, he was abducted by the rebels of the Lord Resistance Army from our home. Actually, I traveled home with him. And then I left in the morning and left to walk to town with some two cattle. And for him, he said, I'll follow you up with a bicycle because the road was too unsafe that you cannot go together. As soon as I left home, the, we entered the ambush, the rebel ambush. They chased us. Me, I was walking with another young boy. I went across the valley on the other side. And for him, he was following us. But when they learned that we were being chased, he thought we were already taken. And there was no phone. There was nothing. The road was blocked. There was no way he could get in touch with me. He spent a night. At night, in the same house that we slept in, in the same bed that we shared, the rebel came and took him. And I was the last family member to see him. So when he was taken, I was, I was so, I was so lost. That's when I thought, 
after all these years we've been working together, we committed to nonviolence. And we prayed so hard to God. And we dedicated ourselves that we would never pick up the gun to fight anybody. We were wondering why would God allow him, who was a pastor, a church pastor, to be abducted by the rebel. And yet he was even praying for the internally displaced persons. And then what about our commitment to nonviolence? What who, who is betraying us? Is, are we the one betraying ourselves? We are expecting so much, or the supernatural power has betrayed us. We were asking ourselves so many questions. And then our mother had already passed away. But that was the most difficult thing. I was lost for a period of three months. I, I was so traumatized that I would just walk in any direction, any, any way. I also started regretting maybe if I knew how to shoot guns, I would have... I would have rescued my brother and my cousin. But then something kept on saying, no, your choice to not shoot up the gun was the right choice. Stick to it. That was the decision you made. And then he was taken, when he was, was taken, he waited for days. Days became weeks. He waited for weeks. Weeks became months. Months became years. And to date, it's, it's almost 20 years. 19 years ago when he was taken, and he has not come back. We don't know where he is today. Presumably dead or alive, but we can just say he is in the, in the land of the missing people. We don't know what happened to him. And we wish we knew, but we didn't know. But that kind of pressure, I was, I was so traumatized going through the most traumatic moment, walking in sometimes the direction where the rebels were going, I ended up walking to the IDP camp somewhere where I found some vulnerable children were lining up to receive the food aid. And they came so early. It was still dark when they came. But when the truck arrived at around 8 in the morning, other able-bodied came and pushed away these orphans, these wounded people, these old people, these vulnerable disabled people who had come earlier to be ahead in the line. They were pushed away, and they waited until around four or five, and they started looking for the pieces, the fallen pieces of beans and, and corns. When I saw that, I walked back home, was very hungry. The next day I came back, and they, they did the same. They lined up, and I saw people coming in to push them. I became, I became physically very, almost violent. I told them, said, these people were here first. They are going to get food. And I don't care whoever is here, I'm ready to fight anybody who's going to try to push these people away. And then people are wondering, who is this guy? He's not even from here. What is he doing? I was a muscular young man then. And then they were looking at me and said, suspiciously thinking maybe I am a part of the rebel because nobody knew about me. But people, why is he becoming, why is he being so nice to this orphan, these child dead families, these wounded, war wounded people? And I said, no, I saw this could be my brother's children. This could have been me. And I helped them got the food. Something in me kept on burning. The next day I came back, I did the same. People were becoming suspicious. Why was I being so nice? It's funny that sometimes if you're nice, people become suspicious of you. What do you want that you're being so nice? That, that's the world we're in. I went on to form this organization called African Youth Initiative Network, HINET, in 2006, no, 2005 after going through many struggles in studies. I was not so educated, didn't even have money. I formed this primarily to help me continue with my culture, promoting the spirit I had for Peace Club, which I formed when I was 13 years in the camp. So African Youth Initiative Network was an advanced version of the Peace Club I started in the camp many, many years ago. Primarily, I formed the organization to help me mobilize youth and community into promoting peace and justice. And then you realize there were so many war wounded people that needed to be supported. And then we started now mobilizing people to receive medical rehabilitation treatment and trauma support. We treated, to date, we have treated over 25,000 people have received reconstructive surgical rehabilitation. Those whose lips, nose, ears were cut off, and sexually abused people, we've been treating them. And of course, they say it's good to talk about peace talk about justice, talk about forgiveness. But 
what the question that everybody should ask is, what if you encounter you are, should have been enemies or you are real enemy, what would you do? I went through that experience. One day I went on to provide psychosocial support to young people in the community. I found a group of young people whom I knew their community very well. And then they started telling me stories how they were abducted, the atrocities they committed while they were in the bush. And then one of them went on to explain how they worked in the camp which I grew up in, in our that camp which was our home. And he kept on talking about the church, which was their operational point. And as the church was at home, the one we built at home. We had built a church. Our mother helped us to build a church at home. And he kept on talking about this home next to the church and how they would hide in the church because sometimes soldiers would be in that church. And he went on to explain, he explained exactly how he abducted my own brother. And then I said, wow, this is a very difficult encounter. It, I did not tell him that time he was talking about my brother. He went on to explain. I probed him, how did you take him? Because I wanted to know also what happened to my brother. Because I didn't, in as much as I didn't want to know who took my brother, I also wanted to know what exactly happened to my brother because he has not come back. So he explained how they took him, how they tied him how, with other people, how they made him to carry heavy loads, they, how they were trying to cross the river and they were struggling. And I, I realized my brother didn't know how to swim. So I thought he was going to say they drew up in the river. So I said, wait, no, don't, don't talk about that yet. And I didn't want him to tell me that all those whom he took died in the water because my brother didn't know how to swim. It was too difficult for me to continue hearing the story. And I, I said, can, we, can I go and come back tomorrow? I have an emergency. Because I wanted, to, I wanted to, to hear, but it was too difficult a truth to get. And then I, I started, I told him, he said, I'm coming back tomorrow. I got in the car, started driving back home. I was choking, I was severing, I was vibrating in my body. I said, oh no. I, in, in my own ears, I, would just, I was just hearing the word, it's him, it's him, it's him. It's him who took your brother. You know, when there's that target that you want to confirm that, is it the right person? Yes, it's him. In my ears, I was just hearing, it's him. I was trying to drive, I was crying. I tried to park the car to cry, I couldn't cry, I was choking. I went home, I parked the car, ran inside. My father asked and said, what's going on? I said, nothing. I, was, I couldn't sleep at night. I was freaking, I was shivering. At night I couldn't sleep. And my father noted something was not right. In the morning, I drove back. I wanted to hear if maybe my brother was killed. He started talking about the stories again, how they continued, how they crossed the water using the string, and how they abducted other people, they forced people to be killed. It was again so difficult, and how they killed. And I said, no, I don't want to hear this. And I went on. I told, my, I told myself that, okay, this is getting too much. A heavy story to hear. I told the guy that I was going to come back after a week to him. I went to town. For two days I was not eating. I was falling sick. I was becoming emotionally weaker and physically sick and all that. My, my dad noted something. He was concerned. And I, something in me told me, go back to this kid. Don't tell him that he took your brother. Don't tell him. I went back to, after a few days, I went back to him. I, I was asking, should I tell him? Should I be angry with him? Should I be sad with him? No. I, I went and met him. I asked him, if you had the opportunity to leave this community, would you do? And he said, yes. And I said, if I gave you opportunity to work with me, would you work with me? And he said, no, because I'm not educated. I said, no, I don't care about your education. And if it was about education, I wouldn't be here. All I care about is your experience that is such a, such a rich experience that can be of help to other people. And then he said, yeah, if there's no opportunity, I can go. I said, can you go and ask your dad? He ran up to ask their dad. And then the father said, of course, if you can go, let him be your security guard, the cleaner, you can take him. As he came back and confirmed this to me, I wrote the unwritten appointment letter to give this young man. And I said, the only way in my heart that the only way I can heal with this guy is to work together with him. I've never seen that power that I saw there. 
the moment of my delivering the handwritten appointment letter to my brother's abductor was the most heaviest load that I took off my chest and I gave it to him. I, in that process of handing over, I felt like the vibration, like the tremor. I was shaking emotionally. I could see, I, w I went blind. I could see all the dust rising from the heavy loads that felt of me. You know, like I said, what is going on here? I think in Christianity that would be a process of transfiguration. I was going through a moment that I never experienced before. And then I, I felt something so heavy that was so loaded, packed in my brain and everything was falling off. And it felt like I could hear the big bang sound. I could see the dust. But that was the only process of handing over the handwritten appointment letter to this guy to come and work as a counselor. It was until then, not until when I gave that appointment letter, I was not at peace with myself. It was until then that I became at peace with this young man. I became at peace with myself and I started looking at the world differently. So that process of engaging my brother's abductor, I found peace in engaging somebody who could have been my worst enemy. And I knew it was innocent because I was taken as a child. But I think what I did was to, to reconcile with myself. It was not about him, actually, it was about me. The biggest healing was me. And I worked with him as a counselor. He doesn't know that he's the one who took my brother. Today, we're working together. Thank you so much for sharing that story, um, deeply personal story. Somebody else that we know who um, very much um, tried to, to speak about forgiveness and to help our country and the world um, to get to their spaces is Archbishop Dudu. And I know you had a, a, a personal relationship with him. Um, what, what have you learned from him um, that you continue to apply in your own life? Oh, I think my have met people around the world. I've traveled, I've been blessed that a son who did not even have money to go to school, who didn't have even shoes until when he was 14 years, traveled around the world. I've met wonderful people, I've met world leaders. But perhaps the most transformative person I met in my life ever, apart from my parents, is Archbishop Desmond Tutu. I just naturally felt something extremely unique about him. And his presence just naturally whispered in my ears you know, that somebody was somebody with a different feeling, a different magnetic power was in the house. That is the kind of feeling that I always had with Arch. Also his teaching, his invocation, speeches, books, the power, the, you know, it was so relatable. It was so much what kept me. So I think I became very lucky that I was even somehow chosen to become the Archbishop Desmond Tutu's fellow, to become a fellow for Archbishop Desmond Tutu. It also came through a, a very strange process. It also came in because I was helping poor people in Northern Uganda. And then somebody who was working there saw me and said, you are doing something that not even a PhD holder can do. And then they went and talked about the story somewhere in London or Netherlands. And they discussed the story in the presence of Archbishop Desmond Tutu. And then he said, I think he can be, he can join this wonderful family. We have this family called Archbishop Desmond Tutu Fellows. I think he should be there. If he's not late, I'm going to forward his name. And that's how I became nominated to join the Archbishop Desmond Tutu Fellowship. It was actually done by him, himself. <laughs> so luckily I met him. Also, meeting him not only did he change my thinking, but he always made fun. When I went with my girlfriend then to his office, he kept on saying, asking Victor, who is that beautiful girl sitting next to you anyway? I'm an old man. And I said, hey. He said, he, he said it twice. And then the third time he said, they said, Victor, you see that beautiful girl? I'm an old man. Who is that lady? He said, I said, Papa, this lady, if you bless us today, we will marry. And I said, of course, my children. So actually I proposed in his house, in his office. 
and from nowhere the champagne and everything was popping up. People thought we had planned it, but I think it provoked it. <laughs> so, but I, I think in addition to many unique things, we had two children. I promised him that if we ever produce any child in that relationship, we named him Tutu, and we eventually got two twin, beautiful twin girls. So we have two Tutus in our family. There's Kara Tutu and, and Isabel Tutu. So they never got to see Papa Desmond Tutu, but I'm sure they see each other and they're smiling. But if I were to make a commitment, I would want to carry forward this legacy. I would want to carry this legacy of of course, there can always be only one Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Nobody can be another one. But we can always almost learn a lot from everything that he, the wisdom, the invocation, the power, the, the, the humor, which is so godly, so heavenly. I, I have committed that. In my work, we are going to build, we are going to raise resources and build the Tutu House of Reconciliation in Uganda. And the reason being, we want to nurture and promote the spirit of Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Let the children coming after us know that once lived in the continent, a gift to the world that came from South Africa. And he is buried in this continent, the land that we all so very much loved. And he's, he's, down, he's being there, he's nourishing our work for, you know, for peace and reconciliation and justice and accountability. And also he spoke truth. He only spoke so much truth, but with a lot of love. And that's what is needed in the world of today. Speak truth to power. Young people should learn to talk truth, speak truth, engage the seniors, but with love and respect. And let us be guided by the wisdom that we saw, we witnessed in the body of Archbishop Desmond Tutu. And that's one thing that we have to sustain and I hope that we shall get resources to build Archbishop Desmond Tutu's House of Reconciliation in Uganda to serve the continent and to serve the world. Tutu lives. Um, I hope that that vision that you have does come through. Um, I just would like to ask you one more question. Um, you've already said a lot about young people um, there, there is a lot of, of anger, there is a lot of disillusionment um, and a lot of criticism of the elders, even people like um, Archbishop Dudu. What would you say to young people who perhaps have lost hope? Um, you come from a, a very difficult childhood, but you've, you've managed to find hope. What would you say to them um, about how they can, they can be in the world? I, yes, it is true. I've seen a lot of hopelessness sometimes across the continent. And to the point that people tend to almost erase uh, the learning opportunity that our forefathers or our parents did, the struggle they got to. I see political frustration, people become the arm to fight, the anger xenophobic attack, people dying in the Mediterranean trying to escape the continent and all these kind of things. I, I, I totally understand the pain. I am not dismissing it in a way. I totally understand the frustration, the hopelessness, the bitterness, the pain that comes with knowing that you have it all as a, con a continent, as a country, but you are still made to suffer. Life is so difficult. Some people are born to live and flourish, but others are struggling for the for the little, for the, for the leftovers. And I think the majority of the young people are going through that. But I think if we care for the continent that we claim to be our home, we cannot work to destroy it. We can only build, continue building and carry forward what was already done. I totally understand the pain, but you know, in as much as we want to be courageous and bring about whatever change, our change should be moderate. We cannot be too powerful that we can only destroy. We have to moderate our approach to change. There is so much that the senior leaders, the older leaders, the older generation can learn from the young people. And there's so much that the young can learn from the senior leaders. The senior should understand that the young people have got the agility 
the dynamism, the innovation, the creativity, the commitment and willingness to do it now. This is a good opportunity. And also the young people should understand that the senior leaders or our old people have got the wisdom, the experience, the, the, you know, the, the preferences and, and the love, the maturity that if we embrace, we can intertwine it with our innovation and agility and bring a more dynamic society we want to. So to me, I would make a commitment. I would, I would appeal to my young people that, let me repeat what Archbishop, the last message actually I had from him was when he told us in, when he met in South Africa, he said, young Africans, let me tell you something, prepare to lead the world. And I said, okay, that's a big commitment. I said, yes. And then he said, each time the world is going through the worst of its worst, they look up to Africa for survival. And I said, Papa, can you explain, elaborate on that? And then he said, look, in the history of the Bible, when famine was in Europe, everybody fled to Egypt. It was in Africa. It was in Africa. And when the world needed manpower to go and build their nations, their capital, they came and took the slaves from the continent of Africa. When the world needed raw materials to build and develop their economies and their nations, they came and colonized Africa. And then he said something that is happening today. And he said that it won't take long. Right now, the world has built powerful nuclear capabilities to destroy each other. And it will not take long that one time, one day, the world will look up to Africa because Africa is the only continent without nuclear capability, without nuclear weapons. So they will need a mediator who does not hone any nuclear weapons because they will be too powerful threatening each other with nuclear weapons. And I saw that happening today. I was always thinking recently said that I wish Tutu would look, would remember what he told us. When I saw what's going on in the current war in Europe, people threatening each other with nuclear weapons. I said, wow. And now, as I talk right now, we have got European partners who have approached us to help to ask us that they have got experts of psychiatrists and psychologists who are working to support the Ukrainian war victims, especially the victims of sex and gender-based violence or sex as a weapon of war. And children who are separated by war or child soldiers or child aided families. And now they are saying that these folks, these psychiatrists and psychologists and experts in Europe, they have it all academic knowledge. They have all the academic knowledge they have. They, but they lack practical experience. So they have turned to us to ask us, can you help us? Because this, unfortunately, this experience is only found in Africa. And we have already started this all week. We have been doing training for hundreds of Ukrainian, European psychologists and psychiatrists on how to handle and support women and children who are victims of war. Victor, thank you so much for this conversation, for sharing your story. Um, I wish you every success in the work that you're doing um, and hope that your vision for Uganda also comes through. Thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity and I hope that I will be among as many people, many of our friends and brothers and sisters in the continent and beyond who are carrying forward the vision and the candle of Archbishop Desmond Tutu to make Africa a continent of peace where we are reconciled. And we cannot be slow, we cannot be expensive, but we have to be progressive and sustain the spirit. Africa needs us just as we need Africa. Thank you. Thank you.